I'm very pleased to welcome you to the very first Peccadillo Sofa Club Live, an interview with the wonderful Ashley Joyner, who's the director, my crib. Of, <laughs> <laughs> the director of Are You Proud, which is um, a very special documentary, which myself as a distributor is very, very proud of. I think that Ashley actually, actually um, achieved something quite incredible with this film. And I hope that uh, many of you had the chance to watch it over the last week. And uh, we hope that um, you'll answer some questions. Oh, sorry, ask us some questions. But in the meantime, to get things started, I'd like to um, ask Ashley about himself. Um, tell us about you, Ashley. Where are you from? What do you like to do? What do you do normally? Uh, I am a wee boy from Essex that uh, moved to London when they were 18. Um, and I spend most of my time reading and writing and and making films. It's taken a long time to get here, um, but I'm very uh, fortunate that that is my life now. Um, yeah. What's the day job? Uh, I work uh, as an editor. Uh, I mostly work in commercials and trailers and uh, like a lot of short form things. Uh, and I enjoy that because it, it, um, it's a very different way of working to long form. Uh, it's very, it's a very fast turnover. Um, and so I get to uh, use a different part of my brain and not tax the part of the brain that I need to make long form films. And so what, what was the catalyst? What, what, what brought about the idea behind making Are You Proud? Um, I was dating someone uh, who will remain nameless um, and his mum, who um, was a lesbian and lifelong campaigner, not only for LGBT rights, but for disability rights too, um, asked me if I was going to Pride. And I must have been about 24. And um, I responded with a resounding no, because I really just... I'd never been to Pride, I had no interest in it. I really didn't think that um, it represented me in any way. Um, and she rightly um, said to me, you don't know your history. And so really the whole thing started as a kind of um, self-discovery project to kind of appease my then boyfriend's mum. And then I ended up not being with him, but carried on on this project. And it's it's been a really long journey. and. Um, in the process, like I found an entire community that I didn't realize I was needing, um, but was in real deep need of. Um, so on a personal level, it's been a, it's been a really rewarding journey. Um, a silly question, but has your exit mum seen the film? Uh, he came to the London premiere at Genesis. And there's actually a picture of the two of them in the film when he was a child on one of the um, Section 28 protests. Uh, so he's there with his two mums oh, hold, holding a banner. But have they seen it? The um, I haven't had word. Let's put it that way. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So how did, how did you set about this? Because it's, it's a, a monumental feat to undertake. Mm. Well... Where did you start? I started really just with research and I didn't intend to make a film. It was just about myself, like learning and kind of trying to find a place for myself in the world. And uh, then I came across section 28 and I just became very annoyed because I didn't realize I'd been oppressed as a child from, by the state. Um, and I realized that a lot of people my age, my friends and stuff also weren't aware of that. And so that's where that was the real catalyst for making the film. Um, because I really felt like we all needed to be aware of it. And so uh, I spent two years trying to get involved, well, getting go involved with uh, activist groups and things like that and charities. I started meeting people along the way. Uh, and the film really started when that when I started making those connections and th and that that's when the film changed it's it pivoted it, um is where I started to question about like the commercialization of pride um, my involvement with it um its history and its development 
um, the groups that are perhaps on the fringe of Pride and don't participate, but are doing a lot of groundwork for LGBT plus people. Um, how do you get it made? I spent two years not getting anything done um, because nobody wanted to support the project and everyone really responded with a, why do we need a film about Pride? That was the response I got from funders and participators or potential participators. And then the Orlando attack happened. And um, somebody that I'd reached out to for support, like financially, got back to me and was like, I understand why you want to make the film now. And so it gave me a little seed funding as long as I could get to the vigil and film at the vigil. And so I was working my office job and I grabbed a cameraman and I grabbed their equipment. I was like, see you later, I'm off. And um, we went to the vigil and then it, that was, that's where it started. That was the first day of filming. Mm -hmm. um, and Pride was two, I think like two weeks later. And so I had this really tiny pot of money. And um, so within those two weeks, I completely rewrote the film and got every contributor I could within that three, week, three day weekend, kind of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so that I could do Oh, this isn't some lighting effect in my room. I've got a, got an ambulance outside. Oh, please, even more exciting. Um, so I had this three days I, uh, of Pride in London on Saturday and UK Black Pride on Sunday. Um, and I was like, if I book the kit on the Friday, that means I get it for the whole weekend and I can really stretch my budget. And so we made a version of the film in that first weekend. Right. Yeah, we made an entire feature film in three days. Oh, really? Well, a version of, I wouldn't say it's to the standard of the final thing, but we made a film that filled 90 minutes. Um, and then we did maybe like one or two pickup interviews that we couldn't get. Um, and that's the version that got into VFI Flair. Right. right. So that, that's the version I originally saw, I guess, mm -hmm. maybe to go now. Yeah. And again, that was like a really transformative time because I had worked on that alone in my bedroom, a smaller bedroom than I'm in now. And I locked my way, locked myself away for six months and I didn't leave. And I was just, I edited the whole thing myself as well. And um, when that was finished and got into flair, I really thought that that was it and it was time to move on. And then I met you guys and I met lots of other lovely people that were really encouraging. And it was like, we are happy to support you to develop the film into the film that it should be. Um, and so the BFI screening really was an opportunity to screen the film to the community as part of BFI Flair and get their feedback and, and see what they wanted to see more of, what they wanted to see less of, um, introduce me to new potential participants. Um, <clears throat> and so it, that was a really, um, informative and transformative time that BFI Flair weekend. And what, what, what were the directions you decided to take after that point? Um, well, a very personal thing. The first version of the film doesn't really touch on HIV and AIDS. And that was a very personal conscious decision because as a young gay man, the fear of coming out and the response to me coming out was um, was connected to HIV and AIDS because that's all I'd heard. The people that I was coming out to, that's all they knew of. Um, and I really wanted to get rid of that. I really wanted to shake that off and talk about other things that weren't HIV and AIDS. And the BFI screening showed me that um, actually what, what had happened was I was actually I had a lot of shame about that period and about that part of our history and that's why I didn't include it and the, re the reason it's transformative because actually what it showed me was that actually um, I should be very proud of that period and it is actually a big it is a part of me it's a part of our history um, it's a part of everything we do now um, and that's not something to be shameful and so I really embraced that part of our history um, it's a very powerful moment in the film. In, in fact, looking at the film, because I, I just watched it again this evening for the first time in probably a year, 
And um, for me, that was a very emotional moment, uh, especially when Michael Cashman was talking about how friends would just disappear. And that's something that I remember very vividly from the time that suddenly somebody just wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, um, although I guess 10 minutes of the film, is it? I, is it? It's probably a bit longer, yeah. Yeah, uh, and the way the film is divided into the different sections, each of the, each part is, is very, very powerful and I think speaks to many individuals in lots of different ways. And I think that's a great achievement, actually. Thank I, you. I had a little tear then when I... <laughs> right. It's hard to answer, right? Um, it is. But also the way the community responded. Like, it really galvanised people to come together. And... Um, you know, it wasn't just gay men that stood up and made a difference. You know, we have, I wouldn't call it a debt, but we have, we need to, um, we owe a lot to lesbians as well during that period. And I don't think we've ever repaid that favour. Um, like lesbians really were there at the forefront, um, supporting gay men's struggle. Absolutely. Um, uh, and I think us as gay men have to look at that and how we are supporting women and non-binary people within our uh, in our community. Yeah, but you also, um, you also tackle prejudice within the gay community as well, which I think is a very important part of the film as well. Um, and how easy or difficult was it to approach that? Um, I didn't want to, um, especially looking at our history, I didn't want to look back with rose-tinted glasses. And I really wanted the film to be a tool for us to have like engaging conversations and move forward collectively. And I think the only way to do that is to be absolutely honest and pinpoint those, those um, prejudices that are within our own community. We have to highlight those and we have to tackle those first before we're demanding things of the outside world. Um, it is difficult. There are lifelong struggles, you know, even people in GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, 50 years ago, there are still long held um, quarrels and like disagreements and like they've lasted 50 years. Um, you can rightly, see them in the film actually. <laughs> <laughs> rightly or wrongly, they still, they're, they're still there. Um, so it's an uncomfortable truth, but it's a truth that we, we have to face. Yeah, and... Um... Hopefully it's something that we can continue to do so, although it is very, I think it is very difficult. Um, I mean, how, how do you think things have changed since you made the film? Um, I will just pinpoint one thing because it came to my attention today. The LGB Alliance, which is an anti-trans organisation, are trying to register as a charity, They're applying for charity status. And that's one of the ways things have changed. The focus on the people that are most marginalized in our community has shifted. It's now shifted towards trans people. And that's something we have to call out. We have to, and they're, they're people within our community. So you can just only imagine what it's like from people outside. Um, so that's something we have to tackle. Yeah. I remember back in the eighties, um, at one of the prides, um, probably 86, 87, I can't quite remember when, but at that period there was a, a movement, again, a, a movement of gay men, white gay men, who were trying to prevent drag queens from appearing at Pride, mm. and, and that which was quite a, a ridiculous thing, if you consider what Pride came out of. Well, so, I mean, radical drag, right, it was a huge yeah. thing of GLF. Um, exactly. And so um, these these things do keep on coming around, of victimising um, groups. Yeah, and things have shifted in, um, incredibly far since we made the film. Um, I think Trump um, had only just come into power when we were like in the editing phase, um, and obviously we have the government that we do now, and. Um, and that's true of across the globe. You know, the pendulum has really swung to the far right. And um, look at Hungary, for instance. Hungary's got a really, like a fascist government in power now. Um, they've just passed laws that kind of 
basically allow it to be a dictatorship in this past week that views COVID-19 in order to enforce that. Um, a lot of uh, NGOs have been forced out of Hungary. So these things are happening all over the world. Um, and that's why I really wanted the film to finish with a global vision. And I think when we're talking about LGBT rights, we have to be looking at things from a global perspective now because things do have an impact around the world, but also it's a time to unite, not just on LGBT issues, but on, you know, global warming, for instance, you know, there has to be a global vision when we're looking at activism now, because we, I think people are starting to see that we're intimately connected. Um, so that's the reason for ending the film on the, on the global section. No, beautifully, it goes in a circle in many respects. Uh -huh. And, and the whole section on um, asylum seekers is, is, is very, 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 very touching, very moving, and very personal. Yeah, and because people have, people have got this image of the UK of being like totally liberal and loving of LGBT people. And this is happening in our own country and people don't know about it. Right. The, the environment that those people are put into, um, no human should be put into. No. Just like torture after torture after torture not necessarily physically but in some cases physically but mentally just reliving that trauma is just i think people need to be aware that that's happening here on home on home turf and then um the statistic given in the film that 75 percent of those people are actually sent back to um yes yeah. facing death is some um, quite a, a horrific um figure yeah and also you know Airlines like Virgin and BA were doing those charter flights. You know, the Stansted 15, who LGBT activists that kind of stormed Stansted Airport and stopped a plane from um, taking off. Um, those people then went, um, had to go through court on um, terrorism charges. You know, like it's like, it's clearly a big thing for the government and they were trying to make a statement with that court case. Um, mm. Mm. Education. Let's talk a bit about education. Just I'll just go back also, sorry, Tom, just to no. on that point. The um, asylum thing is that which we talked about it in an LGBT sense is totally um, tied to the Windrush scandal. It's all about immigration. It's about people that the government don't value. Um, and I think even with what's happening with COVID-19, a lot of the people that they deemed as not um, skilled workers yeah. are now having their visas extended because all of a sudden we're starting to value human beings for what they contribute. Um, and that's, you know, the film does touch on a lot of things, but what I was trying to show is that all these things are connected. And even in that small section, you know, we're talking about Windrush, LGBT asylum seekers, skilled workers, the NHS, like, Everything's connected. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, these these are the people that actually keep us all alive. Yeah, and, and, we, and functioning to come. Yeah, um, but not just the you know. There, there's so mo many levels of society that generally aren't appreciated, um, and perhaps what's happening now with COVID nineteen is something that will wake the rest of us up to uh, and make us think about you know those people that keep the country running you know the the guys who pick up the rubbish every week you know the, these are vital things that once they're taken away um things degenerate really quickly mm -hmm. and i think um you know it's it's a lovely sign of solidarity people going out at 8 p.m and clapping the nhs workers but actually those people need our support in the way that we vote so when, it, you know, the vote this year, the general election this year really didn't vote for those people that we're now clapping in the street. No, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't vote for it. didn't vote for their livelihood. It didn't vote for their work conditions. It didn't do any of those things. Um, and so actually what I hope, will, you know, people need to stand up and make a difference in their voting. I hope so, too. And um, I think once all of this is over, maybe we shouldn't go into the. Politics. Yeah, that's a different podcast. Yeah, that's maybe something we can um, get a few of our filmmakers together to discuss another day. But um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, I think 
I think things have to change drastically after this. And then I think we as a nation have to really collectively consider who leads us and what they really are capable of. Because some of the ones that we have now really aren't. Anyway, um, education. <laughs> <laughs> education. <laughs> education. I mean, the LGBTQ plus history is not taught in schools. No. Um, it's something that, you know, young queer people, they grow up and they don't, and they really don't know our history. Yeah. Um, and although the, you know, the historical section is perhaps 30 minutes in the film, uh, I think it's a very um, beautifully concise um, telling of, you know, the last 50 years. Mm. Um, how did how did you approach that? Oh, sorry, I'm 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 going the wrong way here because I wanted to talk about education and 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 how we get um, these these stories, our, our history, into schools. Um, so. Um, two parts to your question. For, you know, it is a very concise piece of history in the film, and for every piece of everything that we say, or every every story we we've told in the film, there are thousands of others that haven't been told. So I think it's important that we, um, that, you know, highlight that. Um, but in terms of getting into education, we've partnered with um, Celebrate and Educate. So since the film's release, we've been working with them. Um, and for those that don't know, Celebrate and Educate was set up by um, Dr. Ellie Barnes. It's an amazing LGBT organisation that work with schools and other educational um, organisations to um, support them in their LGBT education. So they do training for teachers, they create resource packs, things like that. They go on training days. Um, they have... Um, kind of people going into the schools and sharing LGBT history and working with young people. Um, just so many um, parts to their organisation. So we've um, partnered with them and created the, they've created um, six lesson plans um, based around the film for Key Stage 3, 4 and 5. Um, and we've, you know, reworked the film into smaller modular pieces as well as having that film as a whole so that they can be used within lessons um, and so the film and those assets that we've created from it and the lesson plans are all going to be available and celebrate and educate um, celebrate and educate make those things available to teachers across the uk um, and they um but celebrate and educate you know they're, they're a cost involved they're a charity so we've made all of these assets for free but for those that really want to support um, LGBT education in schools and want to, um, a really great way of doing that is support in Celebrate and Educate. And I think from memory, and I really hope I don't get this wrong <laughs> for Ellie's sake, but I think it's something like, you know, for £50, a school can have all of those resources. Right. Um, I think that's the cost. And so if you are keen on supporting LGBT education, please go to Celebrate and Educate and, and donate what you can um, so that we can make those resources available to schools. Maybe like send a little note and say you want to sponsor your school or something like that. Um, that's nice. Yeah, maybe sponsor your school and like pay £50 and then everyone in your old school can now have access to LGBT education. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Um, we, I, I think we, after the, um, after we finish this, we can put up the details for educators. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. they're an amazing charity, and Ellie is like a force. Um, they're very inspirational. Oh, that's great. Um, we've got a few questions from um, viewers who've been watching the film this week. Um, so the first one here, um, forgive me, I'll probably read these out badly because this, this isn't my day job, I'm afraid. <laughs> <You're doing that. laughs> anyway, um, from Claire Vaughan, um, it was very moving to see the footage of Pride. How do you think our community respond to Pride during the current crisis? Um, well, I think generally first, like, this is an amazing opportunity for us as people, as human beings, to really, really evaluate our lives 
um, the way, uh, especially like the live work balance, the way we're working, the way we have relationships. Like, so generally, I think this is an amazing time to be distracted from normality, if, if possible, if we have that privilege, um, and, re and really start thinking about what other possibilities are available. And so I think that can be applied to, to pride as well. Like, how do we reevaluate pride? You know, I can only imagine that when this lockdown has passed and we have an all clear, that there will be a huge street party. There'll be street parties all over the country. There'll be marches. You know, Soho will be filled, you know. And so if that's possible, is that all we need? Does it need to have corporate sponsorship? Do we just want to be hanging out with people in a park? Are we showing our pride in that way? Is there a way that we can show our pride in that way? Um, there are there are so many possibilities, and I think now is a really great time to be evaluating those and discussing those ideas and and um, pot potentially putting them into action. You know, lots of people moving online, and like um, the Outside Project, which is a LGBT homeless charity in London, they're doing amazing stuff online for people. Um, lots of live streams and keeping people engaged. They have um, like very similar to Switchboard, like they have a call service. Um, they're also partnering with hotels um, so that empty rooms can be used for homeless people. So, you know, all of those things are a way of showing your pride, right? And, and empowering your community that don't rely on um, coming together uh, in person or marching down, you know, one of the busiest streets in London. There's lots of ways that we can, even whilst we're isolated, be showing our pride and support in our community. So shout out to the Outside Project. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now. I'm very pleased to say it's very yeah. proud of that, actually. Thank you, Ashley. And um, another question. This is from The Wedding Club. <laughs> you use any of your friends in the documentary. Do you have a focused idea on exactly who you wanted to, oh, so did you have a focused idea on exactly who you wanted to interview? And did I use any of my friends? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, some of the people I did know before because I was engaged with, you know, particular activist groups. Um, mm -hmm. So some people are my friends. Um, some people became my friends yeah. uh, through the process of making. Um, you know, it's particularly like the, the the guys and the people from GLF, like Andrew and Nettie and Stuart and Ted, Simon Watney, like they've become like invaluable people in my life and I have like very treasured um, friendships with them now. Um, yeah, so there are, there are friends of mine in the film. Um, but also on that, like, you know, the, the people that contribute to the film is a very organic process. So there were a few people, there were a few key people that I knew I had to get in there to tell a story, but the rest were all recommended to me or I met um, through activism. Um, no one, I think, was really like cold called. There might be one or two where I was like, I really want you to be in the film. But most people are people that I met on the road. Um, yeah. I was making the film. And so it, it evolved really as you as you know. As yeah. yeah, and you know, and that really shaped what the film was. You know, we have sixty I think we captured about sixty hours of oral history. Um and so the film was really dictated um by what those people were saying. That's an invaluable resource really. Yes. Yeah, and we're actually trying to make that available now. So um we're trying to make it available by having the archive um, as a whole package given to someone like Bishopsgate Archive, um, who again are an invaluable source. If you haven't been to Bishopsgate Archive, go to Bishopsgate Archive. Um, uh, as well as like, you know, working on extended versions of the film or extended chapters of the film so that we can give them to organizations like Queer Britain, which is, you know, trying to open the first queer museum in London in the UK. Um, so yeah, we're trying to do a lot with the resources, even though the film's finished. Um, but you know, that comes with its restrictions and like particularly financial restrictions. So we're working hard to, we're still working hard to like raise money for those things. But of course, if there was um, a television commissioning editor watching, um, 
this could be quite documentary. Right, you know, some people felt like there was too much in the film and there should be a three part TV series. And so for those critics, if you can get me a commission, I will happily make you a three part series. Well, four part, because you need to update it. Yeah, maybe maybe four parts. <laughs> <laughs> Six part Netflix series. Come on, Netflix. Yeah, come on. Uh, yeah. We'll send out to them about it and see what happens. <laughs> um, okay, and this is a question from KSH93. Um, the documentary touches on the inequality within the LGBTQ plus community and how this in itself can feel discriminatory. Why do you feel this exists in a space where people have run away from this discrimination? And what do you feel we should do to stop this? Um, I think it's Dan in the film that says, you know, we as LGBT people are so used to being oppressed that as soon as we have an opportunity to not be oppressed and pass it on, a lot of people take that, that opportunity. Um, and we're seeing it again back with the LGB alliance, you know, these people have spent their entire lives being oppressed, but now refocusing their, that oppression onto another group. Uh, within our own community. Um, I mean, it just comes back, it just comes down to being a decent human being, right? It's not just an LGBT thing. It's about why are we trying to repress any human being, whether they're LGBT or not, um, whether that be on ability or race or religion or class. And class is something that we didn't really get to touch on in the film, but it's a huge thing in this country. Um, yeah, I think, I know it sounds, I feel like I'm like dodging the question, but it really just comes down to being a decent human being, doesn't it? I um, think that's a beautiful answer, actually. Um, but also, um, I think one of the things that was really came out of GLF and actually came out of the Black Panthers as well was realising that if someone else is oppressed, you are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And no one, no one is liberated until everyone's liberated. And I think that's the mentality we need to be moving forward with. That's definitely. That's, that's very good. Okay, and here's from Matty B. Can you talk about some of the reactions to the film you've come across and its impact on people's lives? Um, can I read? Well, I won't say the person's name, but I got such a sweet message today. Uh, I won't say their name, but. Da, da, da. So somebody messaged me today and said, Man, I watched Are You Proud on Amazon last night and as someone who has struggled with his sexuality for a long time and isn't completely there yet, your film blew me away. Um, and like, it's, it's just messages like that, right? They're just so, you know, I am a filmmaker and so I do listen to critics and I'm very appreciative of the reviews we got. Um, but for me, it's about those, it's about those comments and those messages. Um, and especially people that are in the film that contributed and like, you know, shared us their lives it was about what it was about doing justice to them yeah, um, yeah. and their story um, yeah, the personal ones are the important ones yeah yeah but I'm very thankful for the reviews we got <laughs> 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 like, well, you know, no, well, one of Peter Bradshaw's top 10 documentaries of the year is, is no mean feat <laughs> thank you Peter Bradshaw <laughs> <laughs> and the Guardian <laughs> And um, Jason J um, asks, what did you learn about our community that was most surprising to you? What do you think is the central message you hope people come away with? I think it, it goes back to like my personal journey from not knowing anything about my history and about pride itself. And if people take anything away from the film, it's that we've always been here and we've always fought for each other. And people are still continuing to fight for you, for me, for us. Um, I think that's what people need to take away. Um, because we've been written out of history, right? It was even before Section 28 happened, like LGBT people had been written out of history. Pre-1967, pre like a lot of our history was confiscated and destroyed by us or by the police um, because it was evidence, evidence of criminal activity and so people destroyed it themselves. Um, and so if people take anything away from the film it's, 
is about unearthing all of that history and, and yeah, just making people realize that we, we have always been here. We will continue to be here and um, we'll continue to fight. Yeah, there are many voices that need to be preserved. So uh, this is a wonderful start. Preserved and also elevated. You know, you know, there's lots of voices within our community that do not get heard. And we need to, for those of us that are in a position to do so, need to be elevating those voices, whether it be people of colour, um, people with disabilities or, you know, trans people, non-binary people. Us as gay men in particular need to be supporting those other other parts of our community. Yeah, most definitely. Um, from Toki A, uh, what is next for you? Have any of the strands of the film formed offshoots to take you to another project? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I, I believe that's all quite secret now, so uh, we, we can't, we won't go into de any depth with it, but... No, I could live in this world forever. Like, I really could. Like, there is just endless material, whether it be factual or dramatised. Like, I could live in this world forever because I feel very at home here now. Like, um, yeah, and I think also... You know, a lot of our stories don't get told by us as LGBT people. You know, we're seeing a wave of content that's being created now because it's on trend. Um, but a lot of the time it's not told from a genuine perspective or it's got a shallow kind of um, yeah, thin, really thin line of kind of authenticity. Um, and so I'm very comfortable as a queer filmmaker to be in this world telling queer stories. Um, and I think we deserve that. We deserve to have our stories told by ourselves. Most definitely. And I'm very much looking forward to the next project. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, from Maz O. Um, recently, I attended a volunteers meeting for a Pride event in a rural area and came home nearly in tears, saddened after being told it was a Pride event, not gay Pride and should not be focused on LGBTQ. What are your thoughts on this? Um, there is another Pride event, which I'm making a short film about, a um, short documentary about. I'm not going to say which Pride, but um, it is their first Pride. And um, they have a similar mentality. Um, people are scared of LGBT subjects. Right, because it involves sex. But people focus on the sex way too much. Um, you know, even in some L even in some education um, scenarios, like trying to have LGBT History Month ends up becoming Equality Week or Equality Month, and we have to talk about everyone that's marginalised in one group. Um, which I don't think, you know, people are doing what they can to implement that history into schools and stuff, so I respect that. Um, but I don't think we should shy away from LGBT subjects. Um, also, a lot of prides are trying to become, you know, family um, appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be careful that when we're doing that, we're not starting to censor pride. You know, there are people that like s &M. There are people that like walking around on leashes and in, you know, leather masks. There are, you know, people that like walking around nude. We should be celebrating our sexuality. We should be sex uh, celebrating our bodies. Um, I don't think we should be, you know, we've been censored for so long. Why would we now start censoring ourselves? I think that it's amazing that LGBT people can get married. I think it's amazing that people can adopt. Like, that is a choice that people should be able to make. But there are lots of people that don't choose that. Um, and I think it's important that we're embracing all of those choices and celebrating all of them. Yeah, the true diversity of our culture. Yeah. Yeah. Hyandella asks, what's your all-time favourite gay film? I hope it's a picked one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. Um... 
I always get these two titles mixed up. I'm going to say A Beautiful Thing. Yeah. Is that the American film or the... No, that's the British one. That's the British one. What's the American one? Well, that's a very good film. And actually, um, speaking of the BFI, I actually snuck into the BFI's, um, I think they, I can't remember what they call it, like a media tech, and um, watched A Beautiful Thing in there by myself um, before I'd come out. And um, obviously I fell in love with the actor Scott Neal, who plays the lead. And Scott Neal ended up being one of the first people I interviewed for Are You Proud, just by chance. Um, and uh, I, I should, maybe should have named up him. But anyway, he was very nervous in the interview. So to break the ice, I told him how I fell in love with him. And he was my first experience of gay cinema. Oh, just to kind of like break the ice and cheer him up. And then he was fine. Uh, the interview went. Yeah. <laughs> okay, from Catty O. I love the music in the film. What's the story behind it? Ah, there's, an, there's a beautiful story, and it's one of the things I'm most proud of in the film. The film was made by two incredibly talented musicians who I knew separately. Um, one of them is called Ruth Bowman, and the other one is called Dan McBride. And I'd worked on them on much smaller projects separately. And there was, they have very different styles. One of them is classically trained. The other one likes pop. Um, and I knew the film needed both. And so I, I proposed to them ha- um, that they collaborate. Um, they'd never met each other. Um, and they both just jumped on board and um, together made this beautiful music for the film. And I just think it's, a, it's an example of the community um, coming together to make this film. You know, these two people just wanted to be involved. They didn't know each other. They left their egos at the door and just came together to make this score together. And that's true of a lot of aspects of the film. You know, people gave up their lives to make this or, you know, were very generous in donating or their skills or their advice or money. You know, everyone just came together. Um, But I'm very proud of um, what Dan and Ruth achieved. So, uh, and Jamie is asking, what, what's next for you? Thoughts about creating a similar film about the struggle of equality and the first Pride events in places like Triana and Tbilisi? Yeah, would love to get there. I would love to, you know, I say that off the cuff. But actually, I think, you know, it's, it would be far better if we support and empower people on the ground in those communities to make the film themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we should be doing. You know, even when we did a we did a screening in Dublin at Gay's Film Festival, amazing film festival, shout out to Sean McGovern. Um, and someone in the audience asked me to go and do a film there for them, a, a similar film. And um, they had their main sponsor, their main pride sponsor on the panel with us and kind of, they targeted them, was like, fund him to make this film. Um, but I think it's important that people tell their own stories. You know, I've been fortunate enough to to tell our story, a version of our story, and we should be supporting LGBT people around the world to tell their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and a final question here, I think. Um, any advice for any budding filmmakers who might be watching? Um, the first thing is people told me not to make the film without funding and not to invest my own money. Um, That's what we always tell people as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go against that. Um, just because this film would never have got made if I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. And yes, I've struggled and I've gone times without being able to eat. And there are times when I couldn't even get on the train to go to work because I didn't have enough money on my bank card and things like that. But it ultimately was worth it. And there are sacrifices that have to be made. But only do those, only make those sacrifices for stories that you truly believe in. And I think when you start listening to yourself and start listening to your truth, that's when the real story that you need to tell comes to life. And so only make that sacrifice when that story comes to you. 
I think that's a really uh, nice question. Anybody out there who's looking to make their first film? Um, so yeah, actually, because, thank you. So just before we wrap up, just to oh. elaborate on that, I spent years making lots of shit films. Uh, <laughs> I've done 30 seconds, I've done 30 minutes without swearing, and I've done it right at the end. Um, uh, I spent a long time making lots of really naff films because they were films that I thought the world wanted or like, you know, fashion magazines or whatever wanted. And I was making it for other reasons other than it was a story that I needed to tell. And mm. things only started to change when I started to be truthful and making work that I truly believed in. Um, yeah, I think it's just about being truthful to yourself as an artist. Um, and for sure with that, you know. And consequently, the, the film has travelled the world. It has. Something. Even <laughs> in airplanes. You <laughs> airlines buying it so people can watch it up in the sky too. So Ashley, um, thank you very much for being our guinea pig, being the very first <laughs> victim of the, of, of the Pecadillo Sofa Club. Um, it's been really lovely talking to you. and Thank you so much um, for doing this. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all at Pegdilo. Like, honestly, these past two, I think maybe three years now, like you've just been a bedrock for, for me and the film and the team. And so thank you for everything you do, not just for me, but just for LGBT film. Oh, thanks, Ashley. But you're very, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, from our perspective, we wouldn't have spent all that time with you if we didn't think you were worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still spending time with me so i can't be that bad absolutely and um, <laughs> um as the as this uh, the sofa club live evolves i hope you'll come back and um talk with other filmmakers on other happily, projects okay. happily i'm far more at ease on the other side asking the question <laughs> <laughs> some discussions i hope Okay, but um, I mean, there's one of the, I'd, I'd also like to say a, a big thank you to um, two staff members, um, Amelia Gardiner and um, Matthew Briggs, who are, are the people behind this who are making this actually work. So, um, and just to them, I want to say a very big thank you. And Amelia's waving at me. <laughs> 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 She's working, so there we go. Um, but just for everybody else, um, next week we have the director of um, End of the Century coming to speak to the Sofa Club. And um, we'll finish this evening by running the trailer, if we can, for uh, for that film. So I hope that you'll be able to join us next week, 8.45, British Summer Time. And once more, a big thank you to Ashley for um, being our first guest. Thank you. All right, let's love. Sure. Siento como que ya te conozco desde antes. Claro, ya nos habíamos conocido. ¿Tú estás casado? No. ¿Tienes novio? No, tampoco. ¿Has tenido alguna relación larga? Sí, 20 años. Joder. Me cansé de envidiar a la gente que tiene libertad total. Me extrañaba estar solo. ¿Y ahora? ¿Sigues extrañando estar solo?